Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Mill Creek Government Channel. I'm Jessica Stutzman. Did you know that private landowners hold more than 70% of Pennsylvania forests and woodlots? As one of those landowners, wisely managing your woods can provide you with many benefits, such as income, recreation, or other goals you may have. Wise management is also important to conserving the state's natural resources and ensuring healthy, vibrant forests into the future. Joining us today is Tim Ackerman, Erie County Service Forester for the DCNR Bureau of Forestry, and together we will provide you with the information you need to guide you in managing your forest or wooded lot. Thank you so much for joining us, Tim. Thank, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. Well, and our folks know DCNR, mm -hmm. those initials, that we hear them all the time. They do so many good things for the community. Right. But why don't you just remind our viewers, what does DCNR stand for? It's the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. And so that, that involves state parks, but then also uh, I work under the Bureau of Forestry. Mm -hmm. And what is the particular mission statement of the Bureau of Forestry? Uh, the Bureau of Forestry's mission is to ensure the long-term health and viability uh, and the productivity of the Commonwealth's uh, forest to conserve native wild plants um, and so that's the that's the overall arching statement. So we have state forest land. There's two and a half million acres of state forest land in the Commonwealth. Um, but as you mentioned in your intro, 70% of the forest land in Pennsylvania is privately held. And that's actually what my role is as a service forester, so we're primarily with private landowners. And I thought that statistic was also staggering. Mm -hmm. I did not know that it was as high as 70%. Um, so I, I think that's going to be really eye-opening to our viewers. Mm -hmm. and, and again, most of this is in their, maybe in, in their own backyard even. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Here in, here in Erie County, 90% of the forest land is privately held. 90%? Yes. Wow, that's incredible. Oh my gosh. And so um, I also understand that you're fairly new to your position yes, I am. as service forester. Yes. So why don't you tell us, you know, where did you come from before this mm -hmm. and what made you want to take on this new role? I'm actually an Erie County native. Um, I grew up out in Gerard Township and such. Mm -hmm. So went away through military service, did a, um, some college down at Penn State, uh, recently graduated from Penn State um, and came on to this position in August. Oh, so I'm wonderful. excited to be here. I never would in my wildest dreams would have thought I'd be able to come back to my home county and work in forestry. Right, right. And what and what new things do you think you're going to be able to bring back, you know, either from Penn State or your other experiences to help you in this position? Um, it's a little bit different from perspective where um, I've got a background in wildlife habitat management also. Mm -hmm. um, that's been an interest of mine. That's what originally got me involved in forestry. That's what I went to school for initially, wanted to do habitat work. Um, and realize that forestry is an awesome vehicle for accomplishing the mission within that. Um, and the Bureau of Forestry, uh, coupled with other state agencies throughout the Commonwealth, um, that's part of their mission. And so here in Erie County, it's, it's neat to be able to come back and be able to execute that mission. Mm -hmm. And we're so glad to have you. So welcome aboard. Oh, thank you. I know that our um, residents are very familiar with our Tree Vitalize program. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to announce that we did, uh, we're awarded our Tree Vitalize grant yes. again for 2017. Mm -hmm. So we're going to work very closely here with Tim to execute that grant and plant another 50 trees in Mill Creek Township right. um, in parks and along the road right of way. So we're very, very excited to mm -hmm. do that. So, but jumping into, um, into this interview. Mm -hmm. um, what is your role in Erie County as service forester and and uh, even more on the ground maybe in Mill Creek Township? Okay. In general as, as a Erie County service forester <clears throat> my primary responsibility is to work with private landowners, forest landowners, people who just have the trees in their backyard and help provide technical advice and assistance on how to manage their woods. Um, and so that, that's my main role is working with private landowners. I also work with government agencies and municipalities and schools and help them make some management decisions and execute some of that management. You mentioned Tree Vitalize, mm -hmm. that's a great program that to get expand the tree canopy across the Commonwealth and help as an education and outreach program. That's another aspect of my job is I work in education and outreach. Mm -hmm. I work with in instances like this for TV interviews. I go to schools, do um, different programs that way, Envirothon. So there's a lot of different aspects to the job. Um, like I said, to reiterate in the very beginning, we work primarily with private landowners. Now within Mill Creek Township, working with urban forestry and community forestry, looking at shade trees, the community parks that you guys have, and then the Tree Vitalized Program, and even Tree City USA. Mm -hmm. um, been aw potentially awarded that um, yes. Tree City recognition, recognition. So yes, we this we were awarded it, and um, we just so we were a Tree City USA first time first mm -hmm. year last year. Right, and so we applied for our application again. So mm -hmm. hopefully, as long as everything goes well, we will be in the second yep. year of our Tree City USA status. So that's very very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and you also mentioned Envirothon. I yes. know some people may have heard of that, but don't really know what it is. 
Um, it's an educational opportunity the Erie County Conservation District, or most of the conservation districts across the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. Put that out there. It's a competition about fifth grade uh, students work through different environmental uh, projects, and it's kind of a competition to show their knowledge in that. And so one of the responsibilities I have is I work in the forestry section and mm -hmm. just kind of help oversee that. Right, right. And so as service forester, you mentioned that you do help guide a lot of the landowners in, mm -hmm. you know, making, helping make good decisions mm -hmm. with their forested land. How might that, your position differ from maybe a paid consulting forester? My role is to provide recommendations and technical advice to them. A paid consulting forester, they actually can execute the management on the ground. So when it comes to commercial timber sales, the professional consulting forester, that's the individual that works simply through a contract process with a landowner to actually execute that. Mm -hmm. As the service forester, I can help out and make ma management recommendations. I can even help them do a little bit of non-commercial work mm -hmm. uh, as far as forest health improvement. But it's primarily um, an information uh, role that I have. Um, and then we have, a, we have a list of foresters who are on, a, a, that provide services in Erie County. And we furnish that list to um, the landowners and the landowners can go through that process and select mm -hmm. which forester they want to use to actually execute a timber sale on their property. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I did go on your website mm -hmm. um, and, and we'll show some images from that, but you're right, that list is very extensive. The website is a wealth of knowledge. You're mm -hmm. going to get a lot of good information off the website. Mm -hmm. What is the website? Can you share that? Uh, the website is dcnr.state.pa. Uh, forward slash forestry, forward slash your woods. That gets you to the commu rural and community forestry mm -hmm. area, but the for forward slash forestry gets you to the Bureau of Forestry website, and there's a whole right. lot of information on there. There is. I mean, I know that if you go to the DCNR website, mm -hmm. in and of itself, that's a lot of information, right. but specifically for what we're talking about, you're going to want to go to the your woods section. Yes. So we'll put that on TV so okay. everyone knows where to find that. Mm -hmm. um, so do you help monitor forest health then? Yes, in, in, to some degree. And within the Bureau of Forestry, we have actually a formal section that does insect and disease uh, monitoring and control um, but my role as the uh, Erie County Service Forester in Erie County I'm kind of the eyes on the ground for the Bureau of Forestry mm -hmm. to monitor that on private land whenever I have the opportunity to visit private landowners and then also with communities like Mill Creek to look at their general health of their trees and to monitor that so within that some of the things that are coming up is some people may be aware of emerald ash borer. Mm -hmm. It's a, an invasive pest that's come into the country. It's been in Erie County, or at least been known in Erie County for the last handful of years. Mm -hmm. um, and coming up soon, we're going to start, unfortunately, seeing a lot of mortality among our ash trees. And so that's right. something that communities and landowners can start to consider mm -hmm. how to execute management relating to their ash trees. Mm -hmm. um, and so within that, that's one thing that we, I, I'm available for technical advice on that, both to the landowner and to the communities. Um, and one of the big things that we always talk about with that is how we mitigate the spread of these invasive species and these forest pests, mainly the in these insects. Um, emerald ash borer is one of the ones that we're seeing a lot of nasty effects from right now. Mm -hmm. There's a couple other ones that are out there, hemlock woolly adelgid, that's not in the county yet, we're monitoring for that. Um, an Asian longhorn beetle, that's not necessarily in Pennsylvania that we're aware of yet. Mm -hmm. We think it's in New York, I'm pretty sure it's in Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things, all of that to say is one of our constant messages is to not move firewood if you can't help right. it. Try to keep it in the county. If you cut it on your property and you can burn it on your property, that's the best practice. Um, but as a general rule of thumb, if you can keep the firewood you cut in, in the county, that's the best way. That mm -hmm. way it, it, it mitigates that spread. And emerald ash borer is one of those insects that's very easily spread by that. And mm -hmm. Asian longhorn beetles another one too. Right, right. So that, that's a really important message. I want to mm -hmm. repeat that. Don't spread or move firewood. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to go camping, um, say down um, at the Kinzu Dam or in the Allegheny Forest, right. If, you know, if you have logs here, leave them here, you know, have your mm -hmm. little um, backyard bonfire pit that, you know, you can use them on that. Um, but when you get to your campsite, you should use the firewood provided, mm -hmm. you know, by... That's the best practice. That helps, it helps everybody else and helps mm -hmm. keep your forest protected. Exactly, exactly. And you mentioned the emerald ash borer. Mm -hmm. We'll show a picture here on the screen of that. But it is actually a green, shiny bug. Yes, it is. Emerald, it, it, it describes it very well. Right. Um, some of the indications that we see on our ash trees are, and it, it look, we, right now it's only focusing on ash and we're hoping that it only stays with ash and that's what we're seeing with a lot of the research that's being done. Um, some of the evidence of it is, is uh, bird peck, which we'll show an image of that also. Mm -hmm. um, what ends up happening is the, the, the insect bores in there, lays its eggs and its larvae live just behind the bark. Mm -hmm. um, and woodpeckers end up finding those larvae and they will start to peck out that tree very much so and then that's when we start seeing the damage on the tree. Mm -hmm. What it eventually does is they 
essentially girdle a tree, the bug does, and it ends up causing mortality. Mm -hmm. um, some trees may be resilient, but most we're finding out are not, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But as I said, as the bird pack, that, that really shows the evidence of it. And once we see that, we know that that bug's probably been in that tree for mm -hmm. a good handful of years. Right, right. And it, and, and if, from what I've seen, there's it's also like it weasels its way through. It almost looks like when you peel the bark back, like mm -hmm. like worms almost, right, but it's the, not, it's this beetle. It's the beetle and it's the larva of that beetle. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it creates these galleries and it feeds on the in the inner bark of the tree. Mm -hmm. And then that, as it feeds around the tree, it shuts off all the ability to tree to take up nutrients Right, and right. There are some treatment options of, that are available to, to landowners and to communities, um, stem injections with insecticides, there's ground treatments for that. And you can talk to an arborist, you can actually call my office and we can talk about some of the options that are available within that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something to have landowners be aware of. If they have ash trees on their property, um, they can consider, there's a whole host of options for, to them. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the ash are threatened. And so there's, if it's not too late, as far as if we're not seeing that bird peck on those trees, there may be some options for treating the trees and preserving them for another couple of years um, and, and going through that process. Mm -hmm. Once we see that bird peck, we're rel unfortunately, we're very confident that tree's probably not going to make it, and so it's right. a matter of a safety issue of remo removing that as a hazard tree. Right, and we've seen that, you know, too around the township. We've mm -hmm. called out your department, and and you know, like I said, thankfully you guys have sent somebody and, and looked at the trees, and. Um, you know, it's they do need to come down. They're a hazard. They could fall on somebody's car. Mm -hmm. They could fall on a person. They could fall on playground equipment. So we have taken a lot of steps to, you know, make sure your department comes out and you know checks our public park trees. Right. And you know, we we also want to involve you in putting the trees back. Right. So you know, we may not plant that ash tree mm -hmm. again. And you know, what I've learned a lot from your department too is planting a diversity of trees. Yes. Can you explain the importance of the diversity of? of the plantings. One thing that we see whenever we have these forest pests, and there's always pests out there that are threatening our trees, both native and non-native, mm -hmm. um, but the diversity really speaks to making our forests and our, our backyards very resilient. So if we put only planted all ash trees, right now we're facing a big problem. But if we had a handful of ash, a handful of oak, a handful of maples, and a, and a various assortment of other trees, not all one pest is going to attack all of those trees at once. Mm -hmm. So that helps us kind of mitigate kind of the, the, this large scale problem that we have right now with ash. It's something that was relatively unforeseen. Um, so now we're, as we're learning through the process here, that's something we always encourage is planting a diversity of species, both in the forest as far as if somebody's working through reforestation um, or just in their backyard. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, we also favor native species too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a big thing that we like to, we like to promote and, and it's just not introducing the native invasive, invasive mm -hmm. species. Right, too. and I think the words, you know, native, organic, those are so popular right mm -hmm. now, but why are they actually so crucial to planting native species versus non-native or invasive? The native species are just, they've, they've grown here for centuries and thousands of years and, and they've developed well in our area. They're, they're used to our climate, they're used to the soils that are here. They have their own native pests that sometimes may, spe that may spike off of them um, and, and feed off of them, but they're resilient to that. Mm -hmm. And so these invasive insects like emerald ash borer or Asian longhorn beetle, they, weren't, they didn't grow here and they didn't develop with these trees mm -hmm. too, so that's why they pose a major threat to them. Um, so when we plant our natives, it, it, the same thing's true with plants. We have na on non-native invasive plants, multiflora rose and autumn olive, and some. there's a whole list of them. Tree of Heaven is another mm -hmm. one that we see a lot. And, and those actually end up taking over and out competing other, our native trees that our wildlife in particular um, prefer. And in one instance of that is some of, the, some of these non-native shrubs don't produce the same amount of nutrition that some of our wild birds really need that they can get from our native species. Mm -hmm. So all around it's, just, it's a good practice to be able to try to bring those not, the natives back. Right, right, and that's a that's a point I want to share with our viewers. Again, planting a diversifier, diversified tree selection and also native trees. Mm -hmm. When we choose them at our parks, um, you know, it does look beautiful to have one straight row of all oak trees or mm -hmm. one straight row of all ash trees. Right. But you know, by some of the photos we can show you guys, if there is you know a disease or a bug, that will wipe out that whole row. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, it may not you know be as pretty to, to plant you know different species and they look different and they bloom at different times and I guess that may be a good thing or a bad thing but um, to plant one whole row really doesn't make sense anymore. No, and, when, and even when we have that diversity of species, we can get a multitude of color. And that's one thing our region is really well known for is fall foliage mm -hmm. and the color. I mean, our, our maples are the primary species that put out there, our sugar and red maples. But mixing that in with white oaks and red oaks mm -hmm. and even our conifer species like our hemlocks and pines and spruces, 
that diversity, that natural diversity that we would normally see out in a regular wild forested stand, that, that's great to see in the parkland too. Mm -hmm. And I do, I love that whimsical look mm -hmm. rather than that, you know, than the uniform look. So I yep. think hopefully that will be the new trend. Right. Um, but what else is involved in forestry? We there's, only talked about a small, a small portion. I know there's a lot more. Oh, right. There's a lot of things. A lot of things that come to mind when people mention forestry is timber management. So mm -hmm. we think about timber sales, um, moving logs down, down the road on trucks and sending them off to the mill. And that's a, that's a large aspect of forestry across the Commonwealth. Um, but it, within forestry, we've mentioned invasive species, both from pests and plants. Um, so that's another aspect of it, is just forest health. Mm -hmm. um, part of another aspect of forestry is wildlife habitat, which I mentioned very in the very beginning. It's one of the interests that got me involved in forestry. Um, when we look at most of our wildlife, they rely on trees in our area. Um, Pre-Columbian times, m almost all of Pennsylvania, like 95% of it was forested. So the, tr the wild animals that we have here rely on trees very specifically and all different, uh, the diversity of those species. So that's another aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Aesthetics are a big thing, especially when we talk about parkland and, and, and private property. Um, trees provide us with a multitude of benefits mm -hmm. and, and that includes clean air and clean water erosion and sedimentation mitigation as far as having trees on stream banks actually help maintain those stream banks. Mm -hmm. they, they help maintain water chemistry with the leaf inputs that they put into the water. They also help mitigate the, or control the temperatures of water that so some fish species can grow really well in those like brook trout. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, there's a multitude of aspects that come into it. Reforestation or buffer planting, we, mm -hmm. we're involved a lot in actually replanting trees, putting them along stream sides and other areas that it may have had some damage in the past. So. So if people have a, not just, you know, a forested area through mm -hmm. their backyard, maybe they have a stream mm -hmm. and they see it starting to erode, they can call you guys for some, for some tips on managing that. That's right. Okay, wonderful. And what are some of the tools you use? I know I see some props yeah. we have here on the table, and I'm not sure if, if that would be included in the tools that you use. Yeah, some of these are some of the just general tools that we have here that um, most any forester uses. I use it as a service forester, management foresters, and the consulting foresters use them. Um, and these are tools that help us measure a forested stand. And so a lot of what we look at when we're measuring a forested stand is species composition. So we just kind of identify that, what species the tree might be, um, size, in those sort of things. Um, so one of the things that we use actually when we actually go out and do a survey, this is a wedge prism um, and it's cut a specific way. I don't know if you guys can see kind of how that angle is and what I can do whenever I'm out in the woods is I pick a particular spot or a couple different spots throughout the woods that I'm actually going to take a count from mm -hmm. and this, believe it or not, helps me count the trees. So I can hold this up and the way that that's cut actually can show whether a tree is in that plot or not by how it represents to me. So whenever I see and look through that, it helps me decide which trees I'm going to count. Okay. And that's dependent on the diameter and how far away of the tree I am. Mm -hmm. um, so that once I've de kind of determined the, the assortment of trees that I'm going to count in that area, I can use a couple different tools to do that. Okay. This is a Biltmore stick. Um, there's a lot of numbers and a lot of hash marks on here and these are all for different types of measurements. So when I hold the stick up like this, you can possibly see on here there's a couple different graduations, one, two, all the way up to five. Um, those actually delineate 16 foot sections on the tree mm -hmm. as I hold it out. So when I hold it out and look at the tree, I can hold this at the bottom and then look all the way up and this can give me an idea relatively how tall the tree is. Um, and that's when I stand a specific distance from it. Mm -hmm. The other thing I can do is this is the tree scale stick and up along here there's some graduations that show me the diameter of the tree. So what I can do is hold this up to the tree um, in a specific manner and then I can kind of get a good estimate of what the diameter is. And then from this I can actually estimate board foot volumes from it. So that mm -hmm. can tell me the actual volume of the tree based on those measurements. So that gets me pretty close of a measurement. Wonderful. Um, there's some other things here as far yeah. as this diameter tape. That actually a little more accurately um, gives me the diameter of the tree down to the tenth of an inch. Okay. So it's a little bit more accurate than the Biltmore stick. And then this is a clinometer which is another little bit more precise way to measure the height of the tree. Mm -hmm. So if it's hard, it may be hard to see, but if I tip that, you can kind of see how it tips back and forth. Right. That measures the angle of it. And so by looking through the viewfinder, I can mm -hmm. see a couple different numbers, do some quick math and get a good estimate of what the height is down okay. to the foot. And then you track everything in yes. your iPad. So yeah, this is becoming the way of the world. We're uh -huh. moving up in technology. Um, these are really powerful tools for us. So I can use this for mapping, um, GPS work. I can even actually tell what kind of soils we're standing on based on some of the applications that we have on here. I recorded all that data in here. I can put it all together. I can send it back to my computer and go through that and do the statistical analysis to help me understand um, the decomposition of the tree stand, mm -hmm. the stand of the trees. And that can tell me relative age, 
um, density to how many trees there are per acre, mm -hmm. and that can indicate forest health, the species composition, and, and all of those attributes come into timber management, wildlife habitat management, and the forest health. So these are all these things that we put together, collect all this data and look at it, analyze it, and then start making some decisions based on that. Okay, so what would tell you that a forest you're looking at is healthy or unhealthy? There's a lot of different factors in that. If we're seeing one or two species like we've mentioned, as if we see one or two species that are dying across the forested stand, we start looking at that pretty hard. Um, if we see stands that might be a little more crowded, there's a lot of different technical attributes of the forested stand that can show us that. Um, if we, like we said, mortality of the trees, if they're too close together, if they're too far apart. Another aspect of that we mentioned earlier too was invasive species. Mm -hmm. If we see a lot of multiflora rows or honeysuckle or some of these other tr tr uh, tree and shrub species that are non-native and actually can outcompete these other trees, that's another indication of that. Mm -hmm. Another indication too is overbrowsing by white-tailed deer. If we may have really healthy overstory, a lot of great trees in the, in the up above us, but on the ground our seedlings may be actually suffering quite, quite drastically from just being chewed on too much by the deer. Of course, of course. These are great, great tips. And what is this book you have, The Common Trees of Pennsylvania? Yeah, this is, we have a lot of different information that's available on our, this, this most of this information is available on our website, okay. um, but this is stuff that I have in my office when I go out and do outreach or, um, operations and I do things with uh, schools and, and, and public engagement. We always take a whole slew of brochures that we can hand out and I actually have a whole stack of these back, back in my office too. Okay, and this is why we like to bring them out. They are the expert and I have to say the one thing I just can't catch on to, I cannot look at a tree and mm -hmm. tell what kind it is. I feel horrible and you know your your predecessors and, and some of the urban foresters you know they teach me what the leaves look like mm -hmm. and what the bark looks like and for some reason mm -hmm. I, I just can't figure and it out so I need that book. Oh and there's sometimes whenever you start looking at it and you mm -hmm. learn and know what to look for mm -hmm. you can glance at a tree and you have to take a double look at it and make mm -hmm. sure that you got it right. <laughs> right right exactly it's, it's difficult so what are some of the other benefits of just trees throughout our community, whether they're in urban, suburban, um, or rural settings. Uh, we mentioned clean air, clean water, the wildlife habitat. Um, so some of those things may be kind of apparent to us, some of them are not so much. We have you know, wood value, both in firewood, timber value, structural value to be able to use them. Um, but one of the things, that they reduce noise pollution, especially in urban settings. Mm -hmm. We have all that, that tree canopy out there, whether it's evergreen trees or it's during the summer and we have all of our leaves out. Mm -hmm. That really dampens down the noise that we have from streets. Um, it helps clean the air locally. So we have, we know that trees will pull carbon dioxide out of the air and provide us with great oxygen. So we see that in urban communities that really makes a difference on the air quality. Um, there's some other attributes of it that there's been a lot of research done on that we've been able to see that they just make our lives better mm -hmm. for just for the sake of being there. There's some measurable things that we can see about it, but what we notice is that overall health in a community is usually better whenever there's trees present. Um, they've done studies where they've been able to look at patients who've maybe suffered a trauma or recovering from a surgery, mm -hmm. and they've compared those that were able to have a view of trees or a, 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 a natural setting and those that unfortunately were not. And it was very significant that the ones were able to see the trees just recovered so much quicker. Um, so there's a lot of attributes within that. Right, and, and just jumping off of that, because everybody knows I'm a big shopper, I've also heard that putting trees in your shopping districts mm -hmm. will make people stay longer, shop longer, yes. and spend more. So yep. if you're a business in Erie, you may mm -hmm. want to put a tree out in front. Absolutely. Um, we only have a, uh, a few seconds left here, so mm -hmm. um, why don't you just share with us you know, some of the most important aspects of um, uh, what homeowners should know about their tree care. A lot of that comes down to just knowing what kind of trees you want to have on your property, but knowing about those trees. Mm -hmm. Every tree grows a different way. Maples grow differently than oaks do, than different than pines do. Um, they all need different soils, they need different space. Sometimes what happens to a homeowner does is they'll plant a tree just a little too close to their house and 10, 15 years down the road, that tree is now encroaching on the house and caught becoming a hazard. Some trees need different uh, soils. They need wetter soils or versus dry soils. Mm -hmm. um, so those are a lot of the considerations that come into that, maybe planting them too close together. Mm -hmm. um, so knowing about that tree, we call it the silvics, mm -hmm. um, but talking to an arborist, talking, calling me in my office, talking to an extension agent about trees, they can 
help you, we can help you definitely come through and make the selection on a tree that might be best suited on the property. That sounds perfect. Actually, that, and I do want our viewers to call you if they have a question. Mm -hmm. How can they contact you or, or reach out to you? There's a couple different ways. You can get on our website and just get a lot of general information and some very specific information from the DCNR Bureau of Forestry. Um, but you can actually call me directly. My number is 814-796-6787. And then you can also email me. It's mm -hmm. T-I Ackerman, A-C-K-E-R-M-A-N, at PA.gov. Okay. And you've got a great website. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. I could talk an entire hour, I think, about <laughs> trees and our Tree Vitalize program. So I wanted to thank you so much for joining us on the show today. You are mm -hmm. a wealth of knowledge. And viewers, if you have any questions, again, we are really lucky to have Tim here in this new position. And if you have any questions about the trees in your backyard or you have forest, uh, forested or wooded areas, you definitely want to give him a call and get some of his advice. It's going to be well worth it for you. Um, until next time, have a wonderful day and keep tuning into the Creek Government Channel. You're watching the Mill Creek Government Channel, powered by WQLN Public Media.